Hello everyone, I'm your host Jenny Beale and this is the Living in Not Knowing section of the Awareness Podcast. Today my guest is Laurie Smith. Laurie lives in Canada. Welcome Laurie. Thank you Jenny. It's great to be talking with you today. So we're going to be talking about truth, justice and freedom in relation to to not knowing. But as usual with these podcasts, I'm going to start um, by telling you um, a a little bit uh, about Laurie and her spiritual journey. So Laurie's interest in spiritual life began at the age of seven, when God appeared to her in a vision and said, I will take care of you. That was followed by an interest in indigenous spirituality. Earth and its heavens are sacred. But it wasn't until her 20s that she came across yoga, meditation, and what she now knows as the progressive path. And her interest in yoga continued throughout her working life as a lawyer, a trial judge, and as a mother and wife. She started attending silent retreats with a Buddhist teacher in her 40s, with yoga and meditation as a constant for finding balance in a busy life. But it wasn't until she retired 10 years ago that Laurie was finally able to concentrate on that which interested her. She visited India a number of times and Tibet to walk around Mount Kailash. Her yoga fell away as she moved towards Advaita Vedanta, as taught by the Shivananda Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Eventually, a Swami from that ashram introduced her to Rupert Spira. Her interest in Rupert's teaching led her to Francis Lucille, and that's how Laurie and I met. Although life for Laurie has always moved from surprise to surprise, it's a relief for her to discover that she isn't. Awareness is, and not knowing is the key to freedom. So I'm interested, Laurie, in the vision you had when you were seven years old and God appeared to you. What what was that vision like? Well, I was lying in my bedroom. I don't know what happened before or after. It was the middle of the day and there was a window in my bedroom kind of above my head and to one side. And uh, this old man who kind of looked like a very skinny Santa Claus with white hair and white beard and kind, kind eyes appeared to me and said, I'll take care of you. And that was it. And I was just so moved. And I mean, literally moved, physically moved, emotionally moved. Uh, It was, it was memorable and uh, really beautiful. And I'd never had anything like that before. I'd had dreams, but not visions. I was awake when this happened. Yeah, yeah. Gosh. So what do you think prompted that? Well, I don't really know. Um, Speaking of not knowing, Mm -hmm. um, I was not raised in a religious tradition. My parents sent us to Sunday school for a few years because they wanted the host to themselves. And (laughs) we would would usually take the collection and uh, buy a fudgicle. Um, but I did spend some time in Sunday school. I had mm-hmm. a grandmother who I loved very much, and she was English from the English uh, church, and she would occasionally take me to service. I loved the music. I didn't mm-hmm. understand what was going on. But when my husband and I travel, I go into all the churches, and he doesn't. There's mm-hmm. just something about the peacefulness inside a church, which um, I felt not so much at Sunday school, but at the church where the Sunday school was and with my grandmother that uh, maybe laid the groundwork for uh, what I thought was God coming to me. Yes, and I will take care of you. And was Were you under any kind of threat at the time or were you just feeling very small and 
vulnerable, only seven years old? No, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I lived a blessed life with good parents, mm -hmm. with, you know, a lake cottage for the summers. Um, we walked to school. I was a baby boomer. There were tons of kids around to play with. I, I really can't think of anything, and I have no memory of anything that precipitated that. Yeah. So, Gosh. I don't know. It's just, it was a surprise. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that led you during your childhood to uh, an interest in indigenous beliefs so nature being sacred, being one with the natural world. I, I guess, and I suppose you, you, you did would have spent a bit of time out of doors in nature when you went to your lakeside home, yes. and yes, um, enjoyed the walking there. You had is on a prairie lake. And mm -hmm. at both ends of the beach, it was a beautiful beach with the sunsets and great water for kids to play on. At both ends, there was a reserve. And the yeah. beach and where our cottage was, was owned by the Indians, the First Nations. Right. And they sold that land to all those white people. Mm -hmm. in, in my grandfather's time, my yeah, grandfather's time. And uh, so I grew up in that environment. I would do my first job for my mother was doing laundry at the lake. And I would uh, take, you know, five bedrooms of uh, linen down to the laundromat. And while I was there, I would often meet First Nations women who would tell me their stories. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah, I was a teenager when that happened, but I learned a lot about uh, how yeah. privileged I was. Yes. I know, you know, those ideas of being one with nature seem so natural for a child, but somehow, even if we have been privileged to, um, to, to experience that, we lose it, don't we, when we, when we grow up and then maybe we find it later in life and we come back, come back to it, come back to nature. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, it's always been part of my life. I go That's for it. walks. I went for a walk this morning. It's beautiful out mm. there. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've made a point of making sure that our kids have lots of the natural world in there growing up and our grandchildren, the same thing. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a source of healing when we walk with grace on earth, I think. And yeah. uh, I, I agree very much so. Yes, I know you do. Mm. Yes. I'm a walker. <laughs> yes. And then in, in your 20s, you, you took up yoga and meditation. And that's much more inward facing, isn't it? What? What drew you to, to those practices? Once again, I don't know how BKS Iyengar's book came to me. I still have it, uh, Light on Yoga. Mm. But it came. And um, I've always been a reader. Uh, and I was living in Vancouver. I had finished law school. I made a teepee. That was the first thing I did. And then I found Iyengar's book. And our local mailman, I was talking to him one day, and he was teaching yoga at the uh, community center. Mm -hmm. So I went. <laughs> Just out of this <laughs> casual conversation. <laughs> right. And um, so I had the book, and our local mailman, uh, postal carrier, I guess, and his wife and kids and me and Two or three other people would go there and uh, do some things, and it just kind of uh, spoke to me somehow. Yeah. So that so that was hatha yoga. Were you also doing pranayama as uh, uh, as well, or was it mostly asanas? Always uh, asana pranayama meditation. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But mostly asana in the typical Western way. Yes. We wear ourselves out and then sit. We usually breathe, wear ourselves out and sit. Mm, yeah. So were there spiritual benefits uh, as well as the physical ones like relaxation and 
um, just that sort of ease of moving that you get from yoga? Was there, was there also something spiritual you got from that? I think so. I think that uh, it was an early reintroduction to the peace that came from the church experience. Yeah. It's that feeling of peace. Uh, not that I have a quiet mind. I don't. My mind is <laughs> pretty crazy. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yes, uh, it, uh, it, it brought more peace into my life. I just started a yoga class with a good friend who's also in the, on the non-dual path, but she teaches yoga yesterday. And mm. uh, uh, same thing. It was kind of pranayama, well, japa, pranayama, meditation. And mm. it's very, very simple, relaxing asana. Same thing. I felt more peaceful uh, in, yes. in that meditative setting. I'm, I'm still early on the non-dual path and wrestling with a, mm -hmm. a busy mind, well, experiencing. Yeah. Well, Jean Klein used poses from Hatha Yoga as a, as a way of freeing us from that sense of being limited by the, the physical body. But, you know, quite a lot of advice of Vedanta teachers just kind of ignore it and they, they ignore the body, don't they? But yeah. it's, uh, it's interesting that you you started started that way yes yeah. and when yoga teachers talk about expanding out of the body i, I totally get that it's so simple yeah. for me. what is yeah. less easy but i often go to is uh, feeling the energy enter and leave mm. it's uh, it's not just an expansion out it's what we rest in Yes. So yes. That, that's more new. I think yoga asana leads us to expanding the body outwards, dropping the boundaries. But, you know, God, awareness yeah. comes in and goes out yeah. and is everywhere. Yes. Well, Jean Klein used the idea of a subtle body, which is a sort of expanded physical body as a, uh, as a kind of halfway house to expanding out to God. Into yeah. it is uh, interesting, yeah. uh, interesting method. Yeah. Yes, I understand the subtle body. Yeah. So, what what led you to study law and become a lawyer? Well, my dad was a lawyer, oh. and I adored him. I just mm. loved the guy. Uh, he to me was Atticus Finch. From To Kill a Mockingbird. He was raised by a widow from the age of seven and four older sisters. He loved girls. They had a wonderful relationship with him. So it really had less to do with the law and more to do with my father. Mm. Um, my husband is, uh, was a brilliant, is, was, he's retired, a brilliant lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the kind of lawyer that lawyers went to for advice. Mm. I was not that. It's kind of funny mm -hmm. when I think that I'm the one that became the judge. <laughs> you know, here is this powerhouse of intellect. But I was interested in the stories. Yes. So um, I was accepted to both a master's in sociology or law and law. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew that it would probably be harder for me to get into law school again rather than do a master's. So I decided to do one year of law, see how I liked it. And mm -hmm. then for if I didn't like it. And I loved my first year. And I hated my second year. And I mm -hmm. almost didn't finish. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first year in uh, criminal law class that, uh, and I was one of those kids who didn't speak. Until I was about, well, until I was in a courtroom, I really didn't talk very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, in criminal law, first year, the teacher professor asked us why we were there. There were two women and about 62 men. And mm -hmm. the men all said money or I couldn't get into med school. <laughs> <laughs> right. I said, 
and I don't know where this came from. I'm interested in truth and justice. Right. And that's, you know, it's one of the inherent attributes of our of our true nature. And really to, to some extent we we all feel that, but I guess it was that sense of justice and the importance of justice and truth, which was especially strong in you and somehow just led you there and you found yourself studying, studying law. Yeah. Yes, it was uh, another surprise. It, I was not planning that. It just poured out. Yeah, yeah. So, as you know, the overall theme of these podcasts is living in not knowing. And it struck me that this is relevant in a very practical way to the to the practice of law. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, um, one thing I learned right off the bat, I, I did, uh, I was a lawyer for 11 years. And they always say it takes at least 10 years to get any good at being a lawyer. So most of my time was as a, a student. But I learned very, very quickly that you can't trust a person's point of view. Because everybody has a different point of view. And clients would come in and tell me their story. And I, I just knew that how it would lay out in the courtroom would be not like they saw it. Hmm. And um, so what that does is it drives you back into what the evidence is. Where is the concreteness of the situation? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I just never knew. And I was not a very good cross-examiner. I learned that very early, too. I was a much better listener than cross-examiner. And um, so... What that led me to was that there was very little, other than the present truth in the now, there was very little truth in the, uh, the legal situation. You can never build a past truth. It's only the present truth that exists, and it probably bears very little relation to what actually happened in the yeah. event that you're dealing with as a lawyer or a trial judge. Yeah. So... Um, it was disappointing for me. I had colleagues who said, who would say things like, isn't it just great to find the truth of a matter? And I just knew that uh, we weren't doing that. We were finding facts, assessing evidence, finding facts, and imposing uh, results, especially as a judge, that were... Uh, not based on what actually happened. Maybe it was somewhere close, but chances were pretty slim. So it's, a, it's an instrument that is put in place by government. It's the third arm of government and the necessary instrument to uh, regulate justice in a society, not to find truth. So I learned a lot about justice and very little about truth. Yes. Or, it, I guess in a way it was a big learning about truth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> it, it's interesting. Pe people often say, you know, when, um, uh, when a loved one gets murdered, I just want to know the truth. And they, they think somehow that a, a court will provide that. But as you say, that isn't, that isn't what the courts provide. Ultimately. No, but yeah. I remember a, a case where, are you interested in stories? Yes, yes. A case, this is when I was a young judge, um, a case where uh, a woman was being bothered by a man who was not her boyfriend. Her boyfriend was in jail. She called her boyfriend in jail. And as a result of her complaint, he contacted some friends of his from the jail by phone and asked them to teach the bothersome man a lesson. The uh, two young men who went out to the, teach the bothersome man a lesson ended up killing him. 
And um, my application was one of, is this uh, process unconstitutional? Because every single phone call from the jail had been recorded. And I decided mm -hmm. it was unconstitutional to uh, invade privacy to that extent. And um, I wrote my decision. It was, you know, two and a half pages. It wasn't much, but I wasn't satisfied. And my, I went to talk to my husband. I remember sitting on the stairs to the basement saying something's missing. And he said, well, what have you said to the, uh, the victim's family? <laughs> and I hadn't said anything. So what I, I just wrote a couple of lines in my decision to express my regret that how things had turned out. And uh, that's, of course, what the papers grabbed onto. I know that it provided them with some solace. But, um, uh, you know, the truth of the moment was that I needed to acknowledge their pain. So that was a way that those kinds of things were done because the law is very blunt. It's not, it's not very responsive to yeah. difficult situations. It's there for a social purpose, not to assuage people's hurt feelings. Yeah. And there's not knowing which is important for juries too, and, and for you as a judge to communicate to the jury right at the beginning of the trial, isn't it, that they need to sit and listen in, in openness, in not knowing yes. not to make a, a judgment based on anything they've heard or their impressions. And that, that must, be, must be quite an art, actually getting that across to, um, to a group of people who, you know, it's, it's very natural for people to come to snap judgments about things, isn't it? It is. Yes. So somehow you have to get it, get that across. Yes. Well, the there is an introduction, which includes don't read the newspaper, don't watch TV, don't listen to anybody who's outside the courtroom expressing an opinion on this. The only, uh, what you can consider is the evidence and only the evidence, and I'll tell you how to deal with that at the end. And uh, of course, that didn't always work. Mm -hmm. I had a, a jury once where uh, one of the jurors used his child as to strangle him. The, the juror was being strangled by his teenage son to see if the evidence could possibly be correct on the choking that was before the court. Wow. And he came in with his evidence told the jury and the jury ratted on him, <laughs> told oh, me and we had to kick him out. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. You insist on uh, <laughs> testing things out for themselves. I guess. It's a, yeah. Sort of scientific instinct, isn't it really, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> This, this son and this man, oh my goodness, <laughs> who does that? It's quite dangerous. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, I think we all have some form of prejudice based on our conditioning and previous experience, and often it's sort of hidden from us. So it's it's quite, it can be quite hard to be absolutely, totally open as isn't it really? It's next to impossible uh, mm. for anybody who's in that situation. Yeah. Um, it's actually, I'd like to tell you a, a story about uh, something that happened with the whole court when I was a young judge. Yeah. It was uh, a teaching matter where we were told uh, that a young woman young as in maybe 16 or 17, uh, alleged sexual assault against a, a kind of itinerant worker who her mother hired for a few days to do some fall cleanup. 
and there was a there was no movie. The facts were given to us um, in a piece of paper, but there were pictures of her and him. And she was a good looking young woman and he was kind of rubby dubby. And the question was uh, who in the room would convict and who would acquit? And they were the only witnesses. It was his word against hers. Mm -hmm. And almost exactly 50 50 <laughs> was the result. And that says a lot about yes. what she does. Yeah. <laughs> Why would a young woman like that lie? Mm. She's got everything. Why would she bring this on? And then, yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> so the teaching was about reasonable doubt. Yes. And uh, I mean, I was one of the uh, acquitters. I did not think that passed a reasonable doubt by any wild stretch. Mm. Um, uh, but it was such a good lesson. And I don't know of the convictors whether anybody understood what was going on, but there were lots of grumblings about how could we possibly have half the court convict in, in that situation. Yeah. So that was uh, an exposure of a bias in favor of the young girl. Yeah. But there were many other uh, examples of that that uh, I ran into um, in my career. Um, Specifically with juries, I, I ran a trial once, which was where a First Nations woman was raped and choked with a ligature. Sorry to bring this stuff up in this kind of a podcast. Um, and it was so well investigated by the police that it was stunning because usually they didn't do those kinds of things very well where it's a First Nations mm -hmm. person but the evidence just laid out clearly to a sure conviction. And the uh, jury deliberated for days. I had complaints from judges in neighboring courtrooms because of the noise they were making. <gasps> there was uh, a chair broken in the jury. Goodness. Anyway, uh, finally, um, they said they couldn't they couldn't agree. And what had happened was one person, and I know who it was, because they couldn't hide their feelings, even though they'd been instructed to hide their feelings, uh, just thought that this First Nations woman got what she deserved because she was drinking mm -hmm. someone yeah. in his apartment. Yeah. It was a classic case of prejudice. And of course, the case was retried and there was a conviction. Yes, yeah. Uh, I had another case, I had three cases, and uh, a dangerous offender hearing with a sexual assaulter, a pedophile, and uh, he acted for his, himself. And in one of the three cases, there was one conviction and two acquittals. In one of the three cases, three female jury members who convicted him of choking the mother but acquitted him of sexually assaulting her children, um, appeared in the courtroom after when we were going to discuss sentencing to give him gifts. He looked a bit like Paul McCartney and he was such a sociopath and mm. a pedophile that he had just sucked them right in. But of course the evidence was very clear that he had done what he'd done. Oh, sure. anyway. It was uh, stunning to watch. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it, it's it's interesting for me that um, that the um, the idea that we can't know anything for absolutely certain is is really embedded into. The expression beyond reasonable doubt, because you can, there are circumstances where, you know, any, any doubt is unreasonable. There's still doubt, that, you know, because things could be beyond imagination, mm -hmm. um, but it's beyond reasonable doubt. And I think it's very, it's very beautiful in a way that that's somehow embedded into laws in so many different countries. You know. 
isn't it? And it's that same principle that we can apply in ordinary life. We we sort of gather the facts and base our decisions on really a sort of balance of probabilities and knowing that we might be wrong, but in a, a lot of cases being fairly certain that yeah. that, that we're right. But just just having that openness to to know that yeah could be could be wrong yes yes the uh you're absolutely right we never really do know all we can know is the facts that are proven by the evidence that's yeah. Yeah. and yeah. Uh, to get that across to a jury is uh, no easy job it has to be very very clearly yeah. said in non-legal language yeah and, uh, yeah. In the non-dual teaching, we, we we learn not to judge ourselves or, or anyone else. So what what would you say to a truth lover who's called up for jury service and feels uncomfortable about being put in the position of judging whether someone's innocent or, or guilty? And they say to you, well, I know I don't choose my thoughts or, or my actions. I know no one else does. So I know nobody's guilty and I just don't want to get involved in this. What, what, what would you say to them? <laughs> I'd say it's your perfect person to <laughs> be involved <laughs> because it is, it's so impersonal. It's mm. not about the person that's on trial. It's, it's a process that is a social a vehicle for maintaining peace in our uh, in our communities, and yes, it's a blunt instrument, but it's uh, based on what happens in the courtroom, and um, it's necessary. We have yeah. to have a way of of organizing our civil society, and this is one way to do it. Um, and it's a pretty good way, especially when you've got eleven others to to balance your opinion and point out your shortcomings and shortcomings yeah. in the evidence and uh, reasonable doubt is is when you're sure based on the evidence and the facts of the case and whether the elements of the offense which is all very technical it's not mathematical but it's technical mm -hmm. are proven and it's not a mathematical certainty even that's not certain <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's when a, a 12 humans are sure yeah. And it's necessary and impersonal. It, it's, it's interesting that the jury system does generally seem to work. I mean, it's been adopted in probably in most countries, I'm not sure, but um, it, it does seem to be a way of kind of bringing our uh, inherent and natural love of truth that everyone has. Um, bringing that to, to the fore, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, I, I have a, a young friend who's recent addition to Canada who mm. was summoned to jury duty, and he was so excited. Oh. <laughs> I just talked to him yesterday, and he said they excused him. And he, was, oh. <laughs> yeah, he was really, really looking forward to uh, yes. discussing and it is a form of service. Yes, yes. Yeah. And there's a, that beautiful example in, in the UK from the, the 17th century where the, the jury refused to convict to Quakers of unlawful assembly and uh, the judge then find them. I mean, technically they were breaking the law, of course. But the judge so the judge find them and put them in prison for for contempt. And it's incredibly brave and it's a it's a beautiful principle that you can still vote with your conscience if if the law isn't if you feel the law isn't right in those uh, those circumstances. And of course that that led to that change in, in, in the law that you can do that. Although I think jury nullification is sort of um, regarded as a bit of an evil <laughs> among but, judges but <laughs> yes. I did have one uh, with that sexual offense one 
situation where the Court of Appeal nullified the jury verdict because um, it wasn't the jury who did it, it was the Court of Appeal because mm-hmm. the verdict was an inconsistent verdict. And, uh, but I never had uh, a jury that went, I probably didn't have the right case for a jury Mm -hmm. to uh, do as they did in that 17th century case. I don't think it happens that often, but it does happen sometimes. Well, if you have a judge with a robust doubt and um, the willingness to be wrong, Mm then um, it's the same thing. Yes, yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it's just done by a judge instead of a jury. And yeah. a lot of those kinds of cases that are quite value-ridden um, go in front of those kinds of judges. Yeah. As opposed to a jury, because juries can be quite unpredictable if there's <laughs> a ton at stake. If yeah. you talk about a value as opposed to a law. And the law in Canada is, has only recently become more value driven since the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, Section 15 was proclaimed back in mid 80s. Mm. Uh, it's, it's been uh, driven by your giant constitution, the common law of Britain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's law driven as opposed to value driven. But now values do seem to be entering into our law more here in Canada. Mm. Yeah. Which is a good thing. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that Francis um, sometimes says that when, you know, in ordinary life, when we need to make a decision and there's a potential conflict, then we need to imagine ourselves as a judge in a court of law. So that we look at the facts and we make a, an impersonal decision. So we don't just necessarily do what the other person wants. We take a step back and we look at the, the totality and it's, uh, yes. So it, it, it must have been a lovely training for, for you. That's what I felt for the... Um, for following the direct path <laughs> yeah yes well and the impersonality of it yes so is exactly. uh, is it's, it has been extremely helpful but i didn't realize that jenny until you asked me whether i would agree to be interviewed yeah yes you know that, that love of justice and truth which is present in everyone that who whoever they are that in them goes beyond any kind of ego or any sense of being a separate entity yes yeah and judges in canada are appointed we're not uh, elected and there's no partisanship it's done by a process that's non-political I mean, it's always political, but it's not like the U.S. So we tend not to have agenda-driven judges at any yeah. at any level. Yeah. They're all vetted by committee, and yes, I, I think that's I think that's really important. At the moment, it's it, it's the same in the U.K., but there's kind of a bit of a movement away from that, unfortunately. That's oh, too bad. It's, yes. <laughs> So when you retired and you had time to focus on a spiritual search and you you went off to to India, what what drew you to India? Oh, you know, when I was a young lawyer, when I was in law school, two of my friends went to India and I chose to stay in law school. I was in third year and I kicked myself for years for not taking that opportunity Mm -hmm. because I didn't want to be a lawyer. I just, I really disliked it. And so India has been on the back burner for me for much of my life. And then I went a few times before I retired and just loved it. I mean, I I didn't really understand what it was like. I I knew what was coming out of India spiritually, but in, you know, the small doses that I was ingesting. But um, Uh, every time I went back, it uh, presented itself to me in a 
a more robust and beautiful way, uh, just the tolerance in the community, and the, the incredible overpopulation and uh, how people would walk out of their little huts with big smiles on their faces. And mm -hmm. we're so entitled to here, especially in Canada, there's nobody around where we live in an unpopulated country by comparison. Yes. And yeah. The ashram, you know, meeting some teachers, doing the slow shift from Mysore to Rishikesh. Mysore was more yoga and Rishikesh was a light of Vedanta. Yeah. And uh, meeting um, the people at the ashram. They, they're still my teachers. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that was traditional advice of a dancer, I guess, with all the Sanskrit terms and everything. Watered down because my two teachers are, my two main connections at that ashram are both Swamis, uh, but they're both Canadian. One is a French Canadian who speaks several languages and the mm -hmm. other is uh, an English uh, woman my age who went there um, in 1979, I think, and has never been back to Canada. But she was poised and ready to do her PhD here and she decided to stay there. She has a Western mind, mm -hmm. very Western. She and I can communicate so beautifully because she gets me. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, she's got a wealth of experience and examples to share. Uh, and I'm, you know, I, I love her. I see her almost weekly. and. She, she's always got some berry that's kind of like you, Jenny. <laughs> from. So it, traditional Advaita Vedanta, I could have taken that from the ashram, but I didn't. I chose these two very Canadian Western teachers mm -hmm. who uh, uh, taught the um, Quebecois man is uh, more in the old tradition, uh, but this uh, Vancouver woman, is not. She's the one who introduced me to Rupert. Oh, all right. And so, why, how how did that come about? Why why well, did we she were, do that? We were in India, mm -hmm. around having a little chat, a group of us, and one of the group that I was with said, "So, Swamiji, what should we do when we get home? Because we feel so good here, and you know, we're going to go home and get into our lives." And she listed some things and mentioned Rupert Spira. All oh, right. Uh, so I went for it. And uh, yeah. Oh. And so you went, went on, you went on one of his retreats, I, I guess. I did eventually. I, I was yeah. online for a long time. And then I met him in San Francisco. I'm new to the non-dual path. I think it's only the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. uh, maybe seven. But I went to San Francisco and I remember uh, asking Rupert, I can't stop my mind, help. And he said, have I ever once in the last several days of this retreat said, stop your thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and he hadn't. <laughs> so. so what was it about that direct path teaching that, that, that attracted you? Well, that was part of it. Yes. Not having to be a deep meditator in some cave for years and years. Mm -hmm. I have tried over the years to uh, to still my mind, and you know, with very limited success. And mm -hmm. um, but it it also um, that all of the accoutrements paled for me. I just I just didn't feel like mantra and pranayama and you know, doing postures was really getting me anywhere. I'd done years of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just made total sense to me that uh, to use the intellect to understand um, uh, and then not to stop the mind, but to let that understanding grow. Uh, I call it the bhav, to let the bhav, the, uh, the feeling, the uh, the mental peacefulness, that state of mind, uh, take over and be always there, just made more sense to me. 
Yes. I met so many bright people at uh, Rupert's retreat and I'd been to so many retreats and I, I felt like well, these people are getting it somehow. Maybe I can too. Like suddenly my mind seemed like maybe it would be, a, could be an asset instead of a liability. And since then, the Swami, the, the female Swami from India has given me a book that talks about enlightenment through reason. And you know, I know there are other Swamis at that ashram who are now not there, They're, they've left their bodies. Their intellects were incredibly important to me. Yes. So uh, I just grabbed onto it immediately. Mm -hmm. It made sense to me to use what I have instead yes. of imposing all these practices that didn't really seem to be. Yes, they're all about doing, uh, aren't they? And doing in order to, to get something. And almost for that reason, they're never they're never really going to work until you can just sort of let go of that feeling of wanting to to get somewhere and can maybe still um, enjoy them for love for what they are but not what's important is the understanding isn't it yes yeah. and even that is a form of doing the reasoning and the self-inquiry can be seen as that but it's so much more direct uh, and, and confronts yeah. that uh, building of the separate self so much more effectively and beautifully, I think. Yes. That uh, it, it has worked much better. Yeah. Or not me. <laughs> <laughs> so did that give you what you were looking for or was there still something missing? Was it sort of partial? Or? Uh, what? R R R Rupert's, Rupert's teaching at that point in you. Well, I, another, I mean, I, I, maybe I just have a terrible memory, but I don't really remember how I stumbled into Francis. Oh, but yes. when I did, it just, something landed for me. Yes. And it was because he was so clear and precise about whatever the topic was that he was speaking to. And I think I needed that clarity. And I still don't have it completely, but I understand when he, when he speaks to various things, uh, just how you need to parse away all the potential uh, diversions. And uh, so, yes, I needed that. And uh, I also needed, I think, the scientific perspective. Yes. You have helped me with a great deal. Thank you. Um, the... Uh, it, the First Nations spirituality kind of let me know, even I've always thought it was very earth, heavens bound. And I knew there was more, you know, there's the whole universe and there's, it, it, but uh, the science has really introduced me and through Bernardo, yes, has, yes it's really introduced me to a, a deeper, more scientific way of, uh, of looking at what we aren't and what yes. we are. I, I can see that would, would have worked well for you as a, coming from a legal background because you're so used to using a reasoning mind and looking, uh, looking at the facts and deducing things from them. And then ultimately that, that, that leads you sort of to the end of the mind, doesn't it, at some point? And that's where you get that, that understanding. Mm -hmm. I mean, Francis' teaching is, is unusual in that he places this emphasis on, on, on not knowing. Um, was, that, was that new to you? Or maybe it was there to some extent. I think you followed the Buddhist teaching uh, for a little bit earlier on. Um, or was not knowing, was really Francis the first Francis you heard talk First, yeah. I, I, I didn't get into Buddhism very deeply. I just went for mm -hmm. silent retreats with a Buddhist teacher who yeah. was silent. <laughs> yes. um, but uh, yeah, no, not knowing in the uh, in the absolute sense came first. Yeah. And it was 
total sense to me. Yeah. So what what does it mean in a practical way for you now in your in your ordinary life? Well, I used to write lists. I don't write <laughs> lists anymore. <laughs> 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 I, uh, um, I I feel freer, mm. more of a, a tendency just to f- do what I feel like doing. I, it's funny, one of the things that has come out of not knowing and really being uh, open to whatever shows up is that I've returned to rodeoing. Now, I don't <laughs> rodeo, <laughs> but I've been right. three rodeos and I'm going to <laughs> another one. <laughs> I spent my life around horses and and mm-hmm. cowboys and you know cutting and I just <laughs> and uh, I think I I was judging it and being yes. fun to do that that's just not spiritual. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm just having so much fun um, going to rodeos and and um, I love horses. Uh, you know. So you know, my life has become more fun and it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's been full of surprises in the past, but now every day, like I didn't know I would go for a walk this morning. I thought I would get ready for this, but I've really felt like getting out there. It's so beautiful. Yes. And um, just, you know, on a minute by minute basis, I just don't know what's <laughs> going to happen. <laughs> yes, yeah, so celebration. It's, uh, it's how Francis expresses it, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, life becomes celebration, and it's celebrating from freedoms. Uh, not, not you're not um, engaging in activity in order to achieve something or to cover up a sense of lack. You're just enjoying. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I had a, a an amazing experience last night. I, I volunteer at a hospice, which is another thing I, I didn't think I would do. Mm. but I'm doing it and I only do it once a week for four hours but I spent an hour and a half last night with a lady who's got dementia and a broken femur I don't Mm. know what her disease is I'm not entitled to know that and she spoke with me about well she wasn't speaking with me she was speaking to whoever she was seeing about the Lord and Jesus and being so thankful and how she uh, regretted some of the things she'd done in her life. And I thought, oh my goodness, I've learned so much from people in that hospice. Um, But she was showing me the dual path. She's still on her deathbed, has this feeling that she did things wrong and she needs to thank that Lord over and over and over. She must have done it a hundred times when sitting with her. because she's concerned about something she did. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I couldn't speak to her in non-dual language, but I was responding in a way that I thought she would understand. And um, it was just so, so beautiful to, to be a part of that and to see her devotion and feel it. But um, uh, to know what I at least intellectually know, even though sometimes I, I fall away from the the, the, under, the not knowing understanding. I think it's more than intellectual, Laurie. <laughs> yes, we, I mean we often forget what we know, to, don't we? Yeah. But it was it was beautiful because it was so full of devotion, and really, I what I was thinking about was an example that Swami, uh, the female Swami from the ashram, said. She made a T-shirt for uh, for uh, her teacher who was in the ashram, mm-hmm. and she, as she was making it, she was criticizing herself constantly because it just wasn't good enough. Mm-hmm. And when he received it, he said, "This is full of love, meaning it's full of God, full of good energy, full of awareness, full of your beautiful consciousness, which is God." And now she understands that what he was saying was, we all know it's all God anyway. So (laughs) (laughs) why feel that sense of lack? Because you have the odd uh, doubt about um, how you made the t-shirt. It's beautiful. beautiful. 
<laughs> that's that's lovely. Yeah. So what does the what does the kind of continuing spiritual path look like for for you now? Well, Jenny, I still go to my teachers. I'm not I'm not done with with my learning. I, I will be at your satsangs every chance I get. And I hope to meet Francis next year. I couldn't do it this fall. Mm. Um, I still listen to Rupert. Yeah. Um, I'm listening to the uh, book study with Bill Free and uh, other things that he has. I mean, it's it's a big part of my life. Yeah. Um, do I speak out very much? I was very nervous about this because I don't speak about this except in a, a small group here. Yes. Uh, you know, my kids don't know what I'm doing. My husband doesn't have a clue. And, <laughs> uh, but it comes out in, you know, I can feel that uh, I'm happier. I feel freer to do what this body mind likes to do mm -hmm. in a way that is... Uh, helpful or yeah. good and it's not even helpful that's putting something on that shouldn't be there mm -hmm. it's just uh, just feels right natural yes natural yeah really natural mm -hmm. lots of fun and happiness yes freedom freedom from worry that's really all it's all it's about and all of those things all of the reading of spiritual books and the listening to uh, videos and attending meetings, all of that is just sort of reminders and enjoying, isn't it? It is. Yeah, I've, I've anyway. expanded out a little bit in my reading. Um, I, I've read uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is written by a First Nations American woman who's also a botanist. Mm. And um, uh, there's a, another book called Hidden Lamps, which is uh, Zen poems over the last two and a half thousand years by women only with mm. the uh, commentaries by women they're they're really uh, and and this is a step out for me i've been reading nothing but rupert james yes. and francis <laughs> yes <laughs> absolutely mm -hmm. yes francis was talking about that quite recently and saying how uh, once we once we've had a, a liberating glimpse, then we can look at all of these different traditions. We can read all sorts of different um, books and we can see what, uh, what was really meant by what's written in them. And we see it from a very different perspective and we can, we can enjoy those different forms of expression. So it sounds like that's that's what you're exploring now. Yes. Which is wonderful. That, yes, it is wonderful. It's very mm -hmm. freeing and uh, even returning to the Christian religion. Yeah. And, uh, seeing the beauty there. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's been really, really good. <laughs> very grateful to God has taken care of me. <laughs> Exactly, yes. <laughs> exactly so. Now you know what was meant. <laughs> now I understand it. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, that seems a perfect place to, to stop, doesn't it? Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. It's been so lovely talking with you. And thank you all for, for listening. And thank you, Jenny, for having me. I appreciate it.